Welcome back to the Hoopball YouTube channel. We are back again with another strategy-based video with a very special guest on this one. He, You have probably listened to his podcast on this channel in some capacity. He is the host of Fantasy NBA Today, Dan Bespris, on to talk Roto Leagues with me today. Dan, how are you doing, man? Oh, man, it's been a weird day, but I'm ready to go. I'm fired up. <laughs> Give me, give me some Roto to talk about. <laughs> uh, we're, I'm gonna, I'm, we're, well, we're, we're both fired up. And for those of you watching, Dan and I are recording uh, on NBA Media Day. So, yeah, a lot a lot has been just a ton to talk about today. But today we're not going to get into any real life fantasy stuff right now. I and mean, we are going, which is a weird statement there, real life fantasy stuff. No, today <laughs> we are going All through. real life fantasy stuff, you <laughs> maniac. <laughs> Uh, we are going to get this on the rails here, and we are going to talk about Roto Leagues, strategies for your draft, how to tackle it uh, through the course of an entire season. It's a format that I only just got introduced to. In fact, Dan, I really learned it from you, so I felt that it was important to bring you on the show today to talk to the viewers about what Roto Leagues are, how they're different from head-to-head -head leagues, which I think the majority of fantasy players uh, play in. Um, and why don't we just start there? What what is the key differences there, and why do you just why do you like them so much more? So I I, I get it. I get why people love head to head leagues. You have this this small window of time to attack someone you probably know. It's a friend or you know someone you probably know in a long time, and you want to beat them in a given week. So I get that. On the roto side, it's all about cumulative numbers over the course of the year. It's what have your players done over a span of a set number of games in each roster slot. So, uh, and I apologize, my camera is below my monitor. So when I'm looking at your face, yeah. it looks like I'm looking off into the distance. So uh, I I'm better with audio than video. <laughs> People haven't figured this out already. So, you know, if you have three guards, three forwards, a couple centers, utility, whatever, a lot of times people assign 82 games to each one of those roster slots, and you can use your players however you like to get to that game's limit. And whatever they do over the course of the year, that just adds up. It all rolls together into one delicious fantasy stat bucket. And the reason I like this is because it eliminates the last-second variability of a head-to-head -head league it generally eliminates the negative fantasy impact of a player missing one game on a weird Sunday. You know, the, the too many head-to-head -head battles have been lost by your best player just going, ah, Sunday 1 p.m. start, I don't really want to play in that ball game. And in a Roto League, that doesn't really matter. Obviously, you want your best players to go as many of the 82 games as possible, but if they miss one, it doesn't matter when it is. If it's one missed game, it's one missed game. You can handicap for a player's projected number of games played without worrying so much about exactly when in the year they happen. Now, you can still handicap when they miss those ball games, and you can you can sort of account for that. But I mean, the, to me, it it loops back around. The big reason I love Roto is that the team at the end of the year that wins is the team that was the best for the longest during the year, not the team that got super lucky on week 22 fantasy playoff week number three or whatever it is. It's a team that was good from day one to day freaking 200. I know the season's pretty long these days. Yeah. Uh, and I like that. You don't get that week to week serotonin kick of beating your best friend, but you do get paid at the end of the season. And I want money more than I want to beat my friends, you know, 20 or 18 individual times. I'd rather just beat them one time real big at the end and take their cash in that moment. So that's why I like Roto more. It's a compelling argument. Uh, I mean, and I think we can all agree if you're playing fantasy, if you're list watching this channel, you are probably interested in winning some money. Um, and uh, that is a very, a very honestly, very, very defensible position there. Um, t tell me a little bit about the differences that that it has in terms of draft strategy, because I know in a lot of head to head leagues, you know, there's different rankings lists that you go on that benefit one side versus the other um in particular you know totals tend to be a little more dominant in a head-to-head -head league but you would agree that per game numbers are the way to go when evaluating who to take in these types of formats right yeah uh generally almost the whole way through the draft i think the first two to three rounds you still really want to focus on someone who's going to play the vast majority of their ball games you want your big guns out there but once you get to about round three round four 
depending on how safe you want to play it, you could go as deep as round five. You start hunting upside, which I think is really fun. You can take guys that get banged up a little bit. And again, it's not that big of a deal because if you say, I'll try to use a, a, a modern example of this. If you're looking at a guy like Kemba Walker, who you knew was going to be coming into a season not likely to play in all 82 ball games in a head-to-head -head league he's basically undraftable because his max number of games played this season is probably like 68 in new york yeah there's no there's almost no world where he clears 70 and in head-to-head -to -head, that's crushing because he's missing a game more than every other week and if new york heaven forbid has their playoff seed locked up whatever it might be he probably doesn't play in a bunch of games down the stretch either and that adds up to 15 16 whatever 17 games missed that kills you if you had to spend, I forget where he's going this year, like maybe a seventh rounder or something like that, seventh, eighth rounder on Kemba. Whereas in a Roto League, if you handicap for him missing 16 ball games, again, you don't care when they happen. You take if you think he's going to have a nice per game average. And if he's going like around 90, his per game mark is probably going to be better than that. So you take that. And on my on my show, I like to talk about how if something goes horribly wrong, you can always fill in your missed games with Dante DiVincenzo. So if Kemba misses 16 games, you just throw in 16 DiVincenzos and you get to your 82 game max. But generally you can find guys on the waiver wire that are better. And it doesn't have to be that moment that Kemba missed the game in the head to head league. Once his zero is in the books and you're head to head week, you can't make up for that missed game. That zero happened and you didn't get to put a starter in your lineup that day. Whereas in Roto, you can miss eight games, and at the end of the year, you can just pick up whatever you want. You could stream eight days in a row and make up those missed games with weirdos in the silly season. So there's a lot of really good strategy to make up for the idea that missed games happen in Rotos. That allows you to target per game. You want as many guys on your Roto team that are sort of pushing the metaphorical ball forward, where in head-to-head, -head, there's a lot of cases where you want like four or five guys at the end of your bench that are just keeping the ball from, or the rock, I guess, boulder from rolling back on your face. The guys that take zeros, rock rolls on your face in that category. So that, that yeah, you're absolutely right. Per game in Roto gives you a lot of leeway to draft guys that do get dinged up. Can't do that in head to head. Uh, and for me personally, I start hunting players like that, like around the fourth or fifth round. And, and you can take a lot of shots next seven, eight, nine rounds in your draft. Another thing about Roto that, I, you know, like it is a long game and you're competing against the entire league in each individual category, right? Like you gain points based off of how many teams you are ahead of in that particular category. It's a format that incentivizes balance more so than head to head does where, you know, you are trying to win a matchup of the majority of categories that that absolutely has an impact on draft strategy in a lot of ways is, I mean, how difficult is it to draft for a balanced team? I mean, you're usually competing with your entire draft board for the same value guys, right? I mean, like, so what, what strategies do you employ to, to find that balance? And is there any room for punting like there is in head-to-head? -head? Little bit. I'll answer your last question first. There's a little That's bit wild. of room for punting, uh, but I'll try to work my way back through that because that was a really good and very pertinent topic for Roto is... Right. In head-to-head, -head, you can be awesome at five out of nine categories and horrendous at four and be the champion. You cannot do that in Roto. Generally, you're getting tw 12 points if you're in first place in any one category. Five of those is 60 points. Uh, and, I, you know, the other four is four. So you're at 64 points. That's not usually enough to win a Roto League. Mostly you're talking about mid to high 70s in a 12-team league. Sometimes the top team even crests over 80 when everybody else gives up the last three weeks. So it's not going to cut it. Now, that said, if you do the math on this and you're really, really good, maybe you don't win eight out of nine categories, but you're kind of in that top two or three in eight categories, you're probably going to win your Roto League. So you can get away with, I think, a one-category punt in Roto. But in general, I think it's best to draft based on sort of a best player available strategy. You want to build a, well, a well-rounded team. You don't have to look super hard at what you're lacking in each category. So I don't want people to like get to the sixth round and think, oh my God, my team is like not that great in blocks. I got to just go get a guy who blocks shots. You have the whole season. If you draft a guy in the fifth, sixth round, who's a third round value, 
and your team is weak in blocks, you can trade that guy to go get someone who blocks shots. So I want folks to, to probably use a similar strategy with both head-to-head -head and Roto, which is really take the best player you can find on the board. Now, focusing more, again, on the Roto side of things, to build that well-rounded team, I've found personally playing it very boring is the way to go. Uh, I people know me as the Dan Vespers old man squad guy. And it's not necessarily guys that are old. A lot of them happen to be a little bit older guys that have been in the NBA. It's guys that you can kind of set your clock to, you know what their fantasy value is going to be. There's no excitement to them. You often leave draft day thinking, you yeah, know, this is, this is my team. What am I, am I really going to be rooting hard for these guys? But you know exactly what you're getting. You can build the team knowing how all the puzzle pieces fit because there's no massive surprises there. And these guys do tend to fall in drafts because they're not shiny. Then they overperform. If they're durable and they overperform, you end up with these massive wins on draft day. Tobias Harris has been a massive win multiple years running. Chris Paul has been a huge win two years running now since everybody gave up on him. These are guys that people are just like, meh, but they, they're being drafted generally two rounds later than they should be just because... 15 to 24 guys that have shiny appeal move up the draft board. So I, I tend to go that way in my Roto, my Roto stuff. I don't usually draft eyeballing categorical needs the way that I, I think you almost have to do it more in head to head. Cause you're like, okay, I need to make sure I'm really good in six or seven of these nine categories coming out of the draft where in Roto, you kind of want to just take really good players and you have a whole season to round out the edges. I know I talk a long time. Last point on that. To the punting, yeah. I actually prefer to do what I've termed a give up punt, which is I build my team on draft night, taking guys that I think are really good values. They often turn out to be pretty good values. And then by December or January, I look at my team and I realize, you know what? I'm like third from the bottom in a category. For me, it's often points. I tend to kind of avoid guys who score because they get overdrafted. It's very easy to find the one guy on your team who scores a lot, who doesn't do a ton of other stuff, and flip him for rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, categories where you can move quickly in a roto format. I've traded a scorer almost every season for like the last six years for someone who's really good, like a Draymond Green type. And the worst thing that happens is I drop two spots in points from third from the bottom all the way to the bottom. Whereas I might get three or four Roto points in other categories. So you start to look at this ROI thing. Although I, that's a lot of information in one answer. But uh, I guess the short version is just draft the best player available in Roto. And you have a whole season to work out the kinks. You know, nothing's decided in the first six or eight weeks. And look, there's no issue at all with dumping all that information on us. Because look, I am not a Roto guy. I've, like I said, I've only started learning it. In fact, the first league I played in was with you last year, at least to the full you placed, extent. You placed. I That's placed. Right. I was I was uh, number two in that That's league. That's because um, you're good at fantasy sports. It translates. Well, I, appreciate that. I do. Yeah. And, and, I, and I look to get better. I might take some hints and tips for myself. From this video to maybe uh, overtake your throne this year. <laughs> well, I that hope I don't get ideal. too. I know this is like Roto 101. So if I get too far, you just throw a lasso <laughs> around me and pull me back. Honestly, I'm in. I I, I'm, I hope that the viewers like me right now. I'm just in. Try, I want to learn more. Um, and I have. Uh, why don't we pivot a little bit to kind of how like in season management because it's a long haul and it's really difficult. And from a personal experience as a first time player. You know, one of the things that I really struggled with, in particular in a games capped format, was being able to get through that mental block where in the early part of the season, other teams may pass you in total games played, right? And they might have a much higher place than you in the standings. I'm pretty sure in that league where I came in second last year, up until the last two months, I was in the bottom two or three because I was really low in games played. Now You know who was down there with you, don't you? I do. I yeah. do. I, 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 so I, when I saw you down there, I'm just like, okay, I'm not totally messing this up right no, now. No, doing very well. But it's still a tricky barrier to get past because you spend – it's a whole season type of league, and you spend the entire season that far down. But what it all ultimately comes to is that you all need to reach that game's cap, about 700, 780, something in that range, right? Like everyone ends on equal footing. So what are the strategies that you would recommend 
for someone to sort of stay the course, to convince, to, to learn where you actually stand in the league, to just keep it going. It, it, like, it, I mean, how do you get past that mental block? That's, that's the question I want. So it, it's hard because there is a desire for the sort of gratification of being in first place. It feels good to be in first place. And in a head-to-head -head league, if you're in first, you're in first. In a Roto League, if you're in first, you're not necessarily in first. If you're in first and you've played the fewest number of games, you're you're in first. Crushing us. Yeah. So what I would say to folks that are just kind of exploring Roto at a relatively early portion is make sure your league has a games cap on it. Do not go into a Roto League without a games cap because the team that makes two to three roster moves every single day is going to be the team that wins in that instance. It's just going to be the team that plays the most games, and that sucks. That takes no strategy at all. Once your game, once your game's cap is in place, which again, just to sort of, I don't know if I was super clear at the beginning of the show, it just limits how many actual real life games you can use at each position on your team. So your point guard, you might have 82 point guard games. It doesn't have to be one guy, it can any be any combination of point guards, but it's 82 events that occur in that spot. So what I would say is, and this is the way that I deal with it personally, and this is a lot of work, but if you want to do it at sort of a more, a, a, a simpler level, one that doesn't require you to spend, you know, 15 to 20 minutes updating an Excel spreadsheet every couple of nights, is just look at averages as a sort of aggregate. I like to look at averages at each spot, compare it to the averages of every other team on the docket, but it's probably easier just to say, okay, look, let's take a small number. Let's say we're at the beginning of the season. I've played 40 games, and Alan, you've played 50. It is, this is an easier math problem to do at the beginning of the year where people probably don't need to do this averages thing. But just right. for, for a point of example, we could even multiply. We'd say 400 and 500 just to make the numbers relatively round. If you've played 500 games and you've scored whatever it is, 20,000 points. I think you're doing quite well for yourself at that point. Is that 40 <laughs> points a game? Yeah, no, you're, you're like steamrolling everyone. Yeah, it's pretty, you're a pretty good ball club. Uh, so if you played 500 games and the average number of points is something like 15 or 16 per game, is that 8,000 roughly? Yeah, Your team would be so. around 8,000 points? Yeah. With my 400 games, I should be somewhere around 7,000 points in that instance or something in that neck of the woods. Not that this is fuzzy math. I think it's like 60... 400 am i getting that right i don't know doesn't matter i'll get my calculator uh, well yeah over here somewhere yeah it, it's the 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 rocks are kicking around in the noggin but they're not hitting any numbers right point is at a glance it might look like i'm getting boat raced in that category there's a hundred game difference and we said 16 points per game so it should be a 1600 point difference between us so if you're at 8,000, i should be at 6400 so, uh, i i got that right the second try yeah um it's unnerving to see someone that far ahead of you especially now if you look at the other 10 teams in the league and they're scattered all over the place 420 games but 430 444 411 510 474 like there's all sorts of weird games in that boat you might look like you're in last place but if you look at the average production of your team in each category you can get an idea of where you stack up if you just sort of let your team ride from that point until the end of the year. Now, it's a lot of work, and ultimately people will often just say, you know what, screw it. It's easier for me to just play an extra guy, like start 12 guys in a rotation instead of 10 or 11, and you can do that. I just think you can absolutely smash Roto Leagues that are not as hyper-competitive as the one that you and I are in together mm -hmm. by paying close attention to the average production per spot. I There was a league I had no business winning three years ago, but I was running these averages, and I saw, okay, like, I'm slated to be about four points behind the first place team. If I can manage to somehow squeak out, like, three points in rebounds and pass him in that one category, and we flip on that last one, I can win this on basically the last day of the regular season. So I benched all of my, like, I had I had stud guards on that team. I had, I don't remember what, I had a point guard, uh, like a very good point guard who only averaged like three and a half rebounds a game. Yeah. You know, 22 points per game, eight assists, like a steal, whatever. I didn't need any of that. So I benched a point guard who was a top 35 fantasy player, 
And I just went out and I picked up uh, some whack job, like a small forward who had point guard eligibility, who wasn't very good, but was getting six rebounds a game. And every utility slot was a center. Every power forward I had was a power forward slash center who had eligibility of power forward. And I just started loading my team up with guys that were better than average rebounding for whatever position I was starting them in. And I passed him, but I only knew I had that shot. It looked like I was so far behind him in rebounds, but I knew from looking at the average, it was actually quite close where if I really make a concerted push in like the last three weeks, I was able to jump him. So use averages to your advantage in Roto. That is a, a critical element of, the, of, of strategy late in the season in particular. It should help you make trade decisions in the middle of the year. I've often traded away the better player for a guy that just was going to have a better ROI for my fantasy team, a guy that was going to get me two to three Roto points where I, maybe I was only going to give up like one. It was a category I was very good at, couldn't fall very far or very bad at, and really couldn't fall very far. Um, and that, I think, is probably the way to get over that mental hurdle is to not even look at the actual standings board, but to create your own built on averages per game played instead of looking at that weird total. Because it is very upsetting to see yourself in like eighth place and think, yeah. I thought I had a good team. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's upsetting uh, when you hear the smack talk to at that position. Like, you know, like, you know, so <laughs> yeah. uh, this is someone sending us some of me trade Just messages. Wait. And, yeah, I, I Just mean, like, wait. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an absolute uh, hair in the tortoise situation. Um, Screenshot it. Just say, just wait, screen <laughs> grab it. And then three and a half months later, send it back to them. I should have been more confident then. That would have been a much better response. Dude, um, I could have told you to be confident. I ran averages on that, and you were like clobbering the league in every category. And I thought, and I looked at your team, and I thought the only reason he's not going to win this league is because at some point you're going to have to start players that aren't as good as the yeah. ones you were starting already. And yeah. that's the only reason you didn't win it. That's it. And that is something I'm going to make sure to correct this time around. <laughs> um, that, yeah, you <laughs> just have to like. I was I was terrified of your team because of that. But then I looked in and I was like, okay, he's starting like his eight best guys right now. But at some point, he's going to have to start his ninth and 10th and 11th best guy. And that'll bring your averages down to yeah. a, like a more reasonable level. But yeah. I could have told you from like the eighth week that your team was going to be in the top three or four at the end of the year. Well, I was afraid to reach out because, you know, I didn't want to, I want to tilt my head in my hand. I also or... didn't know it was your team. Yeah, oh, that's well, the other that, that also helps. Um, <laughs> I was just like, oh, this team. I've got to keep an eye on this dude. Um, in your conversation that you're telling, we were talking about just the, you're going over kind of like when you rested that point guard so that you could elevate these other categories that had, get, would have more value to you. It got me, you know, it, it got me thinking about one of my favorite aspects of fantasy basketball in general, like the secret sauce that I call it sometimes. And it has out of position stats for players who accumulate numbers mm. that, they that other guys in those positions typically don't think of Russell Westbrook with rebounds or Demonta Sabonis with assists. Do those players have more value in this format compared to head to head because of that need to stack certain stats in different uh, positional slots? I'd say that's conceivable. I'm, I don't want to say yes necessarily because I think they probably also have a fair amount of value in head-to-head -head depending on what kind of punt build you might be leaning into. But I yeah. adore them in Roto. I had Pat Beverly on every damn Roto team for like four <laughs> years before he just got too hurt and too old to be that same thing. He was averaging like nine points a game, but he was a point guard I could throw in there that would get me you know, 0. 0.7 blocks and six rebounds a night. And I thought, this is outstanding. I'm getting a power forward with three pointers in my point guard spot. This is fantastic. Like this gives me a thing that a lot of other teams don't have. And you could deploy him as necessary if you wanted to. Uh, I love those guys. Shout out by the way, to the hoop ball draft guide because out of position stats, they have one, I believe for every uh, guard forward and big, I think there's three articles in that. So if folks want to go yeah. get the hoop ball draft guide fantasy passes. Five ninety nine a month or something ridiculously low like that. So you can check it out. Hoopballs actually put something together on that, but I love them because generally out of position stack guys don't score very much either. It's always like a forward who gets assists or a guard who can rebound or a big who hits three pointers or like a big who gets steals. These are not usually the guys that are putting up 24 points a game because those guys are drafted somewhere. Those guys are drafted early. So yeah, my team is almost always like a weird mishmash of out-of-position dudes. I adore them. 
They're my favorite. Yeah, no, they're 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 mine too. I, I, I any fantasy championship I've ever won, there was a dude piling up stats that no one, none of his peers at that position were. Is always just that that is the secret sauce, man. That is all. That's all I'll say about that. Um, I mean, I think that's that's a really good. Uh, summation of strategy for that draft and in-season uh, element to Roto. I mean, is there anything else that you think is really important for a beginner in this format that we have yet hmm. to cover here? I, you know. I, I would say Roto really does reward kind of a stick to itness, stick to itiveness. I don't know what the proper terminology there is in yeah, a way like that, that just fine. Like, and, and it's weird too, because you could, I could make the same argument kind of on both sides for head-to-head -head and Roto, where if you're in head-to-head -head and you're paying really super-duper close attention, that should benefit you in a big way. But in head-to-head, -head, you've generally got weekly moves caps, which means you can be paying attention super hard, and by Thursday, if you've used up your moves, it doesn't matter. You just can't do anything for three days after that. In Roto, you don't often have move caps because there's no... Because there's a game limit. It doesn't matter how many moves you make. It's not going to improve your odds of winning from adding extra guys to your carousel. So to that end, I think that paying really close attention on a night-to-night -night basis really does reward nicely in Roto. If you watch every box score in every game, you're going to find guys that other people don't. I think you can have an, a, a, a sort of an itchier fantasy trigger finger. I hate to use that expression now because the trigger and oh, so forth. But, that is loaded, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's a, loaded, it's a loaded expression. But I think everybody knows what I'm getting at, which is yeah. you can make moves when you want to make moves, which is great. Um, I would also say tell your commissioner to make the waiver period on players really short in Roto because there isn't a massive advantage to having someone sit on waivers for two days the way in a head-to-head. -head, like, you don't want someone picking up and dropping the same guy over and over again. In Roto, who cares? Again, it's that same thing. Who cares? It's not an advantage to that guy, and they're probably going to lose their dude. And frankly, everybody in the league should be paying attention the damn day that that guy was on waivers anyway. Waiver priority cycles faster. It's great. It keeps people super engaged. Uh, I also like that in Roto, you can award prizes to top three or even top four. Uh, I have a lot of Roto leagues where fourth place just gets a free roll. They get their buy-in back. Uh, it goes uh, half, so six out of 12 shares for first place, mm -hmm. three, two, and one for second, third, and fourth place. Three shares, two shares, and one share of the pot, which, yeah, I mean, if you get first place, you probably want more than half the pot. But at the same time, it also keeps nine or 10 teams pretty involved until the last one or two weeks. Whereas in head to head, I mean, you see teams bail out after the first 10 weeks of the year. If you're, mm. if you're 15 games out of a playoff spot, you're just cooked. You got no shot at that point. And I, you know, I think there's a lot of ways that Roto can actually be uh, almost a safer way for beginners to get in because it, it has a greater margin for error and it's less based on luck I don't call it dumb luck because there is a lot of skill involved in getting to that point in head-to-head, -head, but there is right. a straight luck point in the silly season where, hey, look, in Roto, you can go to the last day of the damn regular season. You want your fantasy season to last 185 days? Terrific. In head-to-head, -head, you should probably only make your fantasy season last 150 days because the last month is dumb. It's dumb. <laughs> and that's really a fun time in Roto. I, I mean, like... Winning a league because Mirza Teletovic hit nine three-pointers in a game, a that's throwback. a great feeling. <laughs> but your league shouldn't have ended the week before be because Mirza Teletovic turned his ankle. Like the, <laughs> the discrepancy in head-to-head. -head. I had the team, and it's, it's so fresh in my mind that we were doing this video the year after the COVID-shortened season because yeah. I had, we had a week, four weekly moves is pretty standard in head-to-head -head leagues. Mm -hmm. And I actually had seven guys get hurt in one playoff week i tried to save my moves to replace injured guys and i had injured guys that i replaced with other guys who then also got hurt i was like <laughs> multiple bucket chains down the line yeah and of course i lost because my opponent only had like four guys who got hurt he got to replace them with his four moves that's idiotic my team would have steamrolled that dude's team in any other i mean you give it a a 20 day chunk of time instead of seven, I win. And I just don't, I hated that. Like all of my money up in flames because over four days, half my team got hurt. In Roto, it doesn't matter. Half your team gets hurt, they're back a week later. You just catch up where you left off. 
So try Roto, everybody. I promise you. I know there isn't that week to week. Again, it's like a dopamine kick. Uh, but at, at, I got to tell you, at the end of the year, you will feel way less frustrated about weird things that happened along the way. And if you're like me and you don't like frustration, you can see me getting animated about it as I think about my head to head leagues. <laughs> try Roto. You, you know, you were saying earlier that, you know, you're much better in an audio format. I would disagree. You are an, an impassioned, <laughs> animated Dan. This is all, this is the best type of format for you. Because right I now. can look at myself and I'm such a raging narcissist. I'm like, <laughs> look at that. Look at that maniac shaking his arms in front of the screen. And I, then I keep doing it. <laughs> I, I was a little concerned that I had no graphics for this video, but really, I don't. I, I definitely didn't need any. That was, no, uh, my ridiculous face is the graphic. Oh, the only graphic you need. <laughs> Um, an impassioned Dan Bespris with an incredible argument for Roto Leagues. And look, I'm a convert. I, I love the format. I mean, I've been playing head-to-head -head all my life, and I still am, and I still will. But Roto Leagues are a ton of fun, a t ripe for strategy. If that is the element that attracts you to fantasy basketball, it is definitely something that you should consider. Um, so, yeah, yeah, this is definitely... For you if that is your oh, you got some uh, one more thought i do there? i have one other thing and just in, in case anyone that watches our youtube videos doesn't know and you want to win your roto league i do a podcast five days a week every day basically fantasy nba today is the name of the show it's generally built towards nine cat roto a lot of the strategy does apply to head-to-head -head as well not a ton of points league stuff um but yeah would love it if, if you guys came over and, and checked out the pod as well we'll go win some leagues together it is a fantastic resource for any league format. And yeah, you can find it here on the HoopBall YouTube channel. Five days a week, um, really consistent stuff and still a regular listen for me, myself. So Dan, I really do appreciate you coming on today. Um, check him out on Fantasy NBA Today. You follow him on Twitter, at Dan Bespris. Check out the HoopBall Draft Guide, too, for all these different articles that plug their way into Roto Rankings, Roto Strategy, uh, out of position stat guys, the whole nine yards. It is absolutely something that is worth your time. Uh, Dan, buddy, I love talking to you. I hope we see you on more shows here. And if not, we you all can listen to him on this channel all the same. So you will be around. I'm trying, man. As many as I can do. That's my goal for this year. I got to get back in the mix. Last couple seasons were sort of tough with yeah. scheduling. But yeah, let's do more. Let's let's take it all to this the social joint. Alan, I know you're you're crushing it, man, on social media. Like, you are kicking. So I know that people didn't tune in to hear us like puff each other up, but Alan is, he's going to be the, the consummate host on all these shows, but dude is a fantasy monster. So listen to what he says. Well, I luckily have a lot of resources here that I can use to help increase ah. my game here. And that <laughs> in, that is uh, the hoop ball draft guide is one of those. So we will perfect seg final segue into that one. Uh, Thank you all for tuning in. Subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Drop a like on this video. We will be back with you later this week with a dynasty strategy video with the great Rhett Bauer, another hoop ball contributor. We will tune in with you all then. Uh, until then, take it easy. Check in next time.